want to talk to you, I mean, I, I think a lot of you understand what Handle with Care is all about. But for those of you who don't, and really, just indulge me for a minute. I want you to close your eyes. Trust me, I'm with the government. <laughs> I might pick your pocket, but you can trust me. Just close your eyes. I want you to imagine that you're a little boy or a little girl, around eight or nine years old, and it's about eight o'clock at night. You haven't had dinner yet, but you've smelled something burning a little bit earlier. And your mom banging around hands in the kitchen. You don't hear or smell anything anymore. So you go back to trying to do your math homework. You're doing your homework because your teacher has been on you again, day in and day out, about how important it is for you to get your homework. You still can't get past your first math problem, and you're about ready to go get your sister or your mom to come and help you because you really didn't understand it the first time you got because you were either daydreaming or about half asleep when, it, when the lessons were taught. You hear your mom in the kitchen and then you hear your dad come in. Your mom tells him that she had burned what she had been cooking for dinner and then he starts yelling. And he starts screaming. And then you hear a scream from your mom and then a loud thud. You hear your sister yelling at your dad and she's going to go call 911 and then you hear him start to chase her down the hall and then the bathroom door slam. What seems like an eternity, finally you hear the police outside. You finally get the courage to come out of your room because you were absolutely frozen solid. You are absolutely, absolutely scared to death. But you get your courage up, you come out of your room, and you peek around the corner and you see your dad being taken away in handcuffs and your mom on a stretcher being attended to by paramedics. And then you see the police at the door to the bathroom. And when your sister finally does come out, she has cuts on her wrist and the paramedics are called in to help her. Finally, a nice lady comes, and she, she gets down on your level, starts talking to you, and says that she needs to take you someplace where you can stay until your mom gets out of the hospital. She asks you to get some clothes together and some toys, but all you have to put your things in is a garbage bag. And to boot, you forgot the homework that you've been working on. You get to the nice family's home where you're going to stay, but you have a hard time sleeping because you also forgot your favorite pillow. You get up and you go to school the next day. By the time you get to math class, you're really tired, you're in a safe and familiar place, and you start to fall asleep. Just about that time, you know what happens? The teacher calls on you. And you don't have your homework again. So fed up, the teacher leads you by the arm down towards the principal's office. You're too upset and embarrassed to tell her what had happened the night before. And you're too upset and embarrassed to tell the principal. Unfortunately, you can open your eyes now. Unfortunately, scenes like these do happen to and around our kids every day. And unfortunately, it's not all that rare. As many as 60% of kids have been exposed to trauma in their homes, schools, or communities. As many as 40% have been the direct victims of two or more violent acts. Study after study shows that stress or even a lack of sleep can have profound negative impacts on one's ability to learn. I recently read a book called Brain Waves. It, it's by John Medina. He just recently spoke at the Clay Center. Medina is a developmental molecular biologist. His brain rule number three is 
Sleep well, think well. Medina notes that a lack of sleep, just a lack of sleep, hurts attention, executive function, working memory, mood, quantitative skills, logical reasoning, and even motor dexterity. Brain rule number four is stress brains don't learn in the same way. Medina notes that your body's defense system, the release of adrenaline and cortisol, is built for an immediate response to a serious danger. It was built for saber-toothed tiger attacks. It wasn't built for day in and day out stress. Chronic stress, such as trauma in the home, hostility, can have monumental impacts. The release of adrenaline as a result creates scars in the blood vessels that lead to heart attacks and strokes. The release of cortisol damages the cells of the hippocampus in your brain, crippling one's ability to learn and remember. Okay, so what's a federal prosecutor doing talking about and quoting a developmental molecular biologist? Fair question. Well, it doesn't take a brain scientist to know and understand that if we don't get to kids who are exposed to trauma early and intervene effectively, then I, one of my colleagues like Chief Webster, we're going to end up meeting those kids very, very early in life under not too pleasant circumstances. If we don't get them, their chances of success in school and in life drop dramatically. To identify and help the kids like I talked to you about in that scenario, my office has been involved with, and I, I have to say, we are a very small part. But we've been involved with a number of programs under our Defending Childhood Initiative. One such effort is called Handle with Care. And Handle with Care, as many of you know, was piloted and continues to be piloted here at Mary C. Snow Elementary. While there are many aspects to the program and involve a, an array of partners, Handle with Care, at its core, focuses heavily on improving the relationship and the communication between law enforcement and schools in order to effectively intervene in a child's life and get them the help that they need and that they deserve. When officers encounter a child who has been exposed to trauma either as a direct victim of abuse or neglect or as a witness to trauma or violence in the home or community, a handle with care notice is immediately forwarded from the police department to the child's school to alert teachers and school staff. This notice alerts educators to watch for warning signs and allows them to provide effective interventions and referrals for additional counseling or services if the student should exhibit academic, emotional, or behavioral problems in the classroom. The handle with care notice allows educators to better understand the cause of the behavior, not just the behavior itself. Thereby helping students achieve at their very, very highest level, no matter what trauma they might have endured. This simple communication and intervention can have a huge impact and has had a huge impact on children already. Since its inception, the program overcoming a few initial hurdles has seen real successes with real children and families exposed to violence and trauma. Officers routinely visit classrooms for positive engagement. Teachers and school staff have learned through book study about the impact of trauma on learning and are incorporating individual and whole class and whole school interventions. And counselors are linking children and family to crucial services to minimize the impact of trauma and to help students better succeed in the classroom. As a result of the problem, as a result of the program, the Charleston Police, Police Department 
provided handle with care notices for both this pilot school, Piedmont Elementary, and really all the schools here in, in, in the Charleston area, with a total of 360 incident notices involving 673 children from just August of 2013 through the end of this last year. So just a matter of months, not years. As a result, dozens of students have and are now receiving on-site trauma-focused therapy at Mary C. Snow and Piedmont Elementary to help them overcome their trauma and succeed at school. Educators and law enforcement across the state and across the country have expressed interest in replicating handle with care in their schools and in their communities. And we want to systematically expand this wonderful program statewide and we're putting in place the critical infrastructure necessary to do so as we speak. But today, we're here to officially dedicate the mental health clinic here at Mary C. Snow Elementary to Jaleel Clements. As many of you are probably aware, Jaleel was the 11-year-old boy who was hit and killed by a car in 2012 on Interstate 77 here in Charleston while trying to get help from his mom as she was being attacked by a boyfriend. We're here today to celebrate Jaleel's life. I'd like to share some sentiments from a very good friend of mine, Diddy Markham, who, Jaleel's, who was Jaleel's school counselor at Malden Elementary, where he attended. She said, when I think of Jaleel, Two words come to mind, clean and pure. I picture him in his bright white shirt, always perfectly groomed, surrounded by friends who adored him. His unspoiled manner and constant smile drew children and adults of all ages to him. He exemplified the word character. He treated others with fairness. He was kind and caring, and he was responsible. He respected his teachers and had high regard for his peers. His compassion and consideration caused others to look up to him and regard him as a role model. Jaleel was known for his ability to make others laugh. And after school, he could always be found on the playground, across from the school, shooting hoops or jumping on a friend's trampoline until dark. No matter how engaged he was in his activity, he always found time to yell at me as I was leaving the school and to wish me a good evening. Despite his innocence, he showed signs of maturity and bravery that few 11-year-olds possess. Since his death, many have regarded Jalil as a hero. I think he always was one. 